now that everybody here is, here is going to be here, um, I'll see homework coming along. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, all I have done is three and two. I've done part of two of these, but just one. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, does anyone have any questions about it or uh, any problem? Okay. Sorry. Okay, so for number three, deal with those boundary conditions. <clears throat> what is something extra, right? Uh, well, that's why I pointed out. Um, earlier this week. Yeah. Uh, well, so what happens is, well, the, 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 the first two boundary conditions are, like before we just have um, like zero and un plus one will be zero. Um, it's the uh, upper boundary conditions, uh, du dx um, equals zero. Oh, right. And so we need two points, uh, two actual points? Um, well, uh, you want to try to avoid doing that. Um, okay. So. So would involve two extra points, and then we want to try to uh, get rid of them. Um, so the are express these same things involving only um, the three points that you actually have. Uh, this is the upper boundary. Right, so x0 is 0, xn plus 1 is 1. Oh, actually, you know what? No. These won't be needed. And the reason why is um, you are only going to approximate your derivatives in your PDE, in this case, the perform derivative, at interior points. So, um, okay. Now I'm not going to. Assume that the stencil is uh, I never like this number in here. I mean because you can have points uh, the, the the stencil uh, points are always numbered in the nose. A0, A1, A2, etc. But you might be using x values on either side of uh, x naught. So my stencil, since we're going to use for a fourth derivative a five point stencil, because it's really the, the minimum that you need for a fourth derivative, and I could number points this way a minus 2, a minus 1. A0, A1, A2. So then uxxxx at a given point xi um, is going to be approximated by um, A minus 2, U of xi minus 2. Just so the indices correspond to which x values you're using. The index is the deviation between your x, x value and x i. Whoops, that's i plus 1 and i plus 2. Okay. Um, I should mention, like, for the um, second derivative, which you know the stencil there, the coefficients are 1, minus 2, and 1 all over h squared. When you have these center difference rules, um, 
can see this kind of pattern emerge as basically Pascal's triangle. Um, so what you would find is the coefficients would be like um, one minus four six um, minus four one um, for the uh, row number four passing triangle over h to the four. So that's what the sense will turn out to be. So I'll just write it in these uh, a's. Um, okay, and this is for i equals only the interior, one, two, up to uh, n. Um, now, the other thing that's worth mentioning, um, uh, as you've seen, that the center difference for the second derivative is uh, second order accurate. The second derivative for the uh, second difference, center difference Center difference for the first derivative, also second order accurate. But um, both of those stencils, and also this one too, use the minimum number of points needed to approximate its derivative at all. And normally when you do that, you only can expect first order accuracy. Just like forward difference, first derivative, you're using a minimum, two points, and that is first order accurate. Um, but um, what happens is there are situations where, because of symmetry, you can get lucky and have the leading error term happen to cancel out, thus giving you second order accurate. Uh, so that's what happens with these centered uh, different uh, stencils. Because um, if I use any other stencil for a fourth derivative that uses only five points, I can only expect first order accuracy. But the symmetry gives us uh, second order. Um, okay. Now, uh, so where you would use this for your PDE, let's look at um, the cases that uh, actually deal with the boundary. So when i is equal to 1, you're approximating four derivatives at x1. You have to go two points in either direction. Um, so when you use um, x0, well, the value here that's the easy case, u naught is zero. Um, and then these are interior points, there's no problem there. Um, and then you have to deal with this, x sub minus one. Um, but the thing is, um, ux at x naught is also supposed to be zero. So what you do is you approximate the derivative at this point by a second order center difference um, involving the points on either side of it at, at, at x1 and x sub minus 1. So u1 minus u minus 1 over 2h is 0. So that will approximate that boundary condition with uh, second order accuracy. But then you can conclude that u sub minus 1 is the same as u1. So, um, so now, if I use this information down here, then my approximation to u x x x x at x one is going to be um, this coefficient times. Now, normally, if i equals one, I have u minus 1. Um, but instead I'm going to have u sub 1. Um, and then here I have u 0, but that's 0, so that term isn't there. And then I have a 0 u 1 plus a 1 to u 2 plus a 2 u 3. And then um, combine like terms. So I have uh, a minus 2 plus a 0 times u1 plus a1 u2 plus a2 u3. Um, now, where this goes in the matrix, you're at x, you're approximating your PDE at x1, so that's the first row. Okay. Um, before it cut off, apparently I'd written up to here. Um, so now this.
this as writing this match for here. So in our system of linear equations for this uh, approximates PDE, A equals F, we're already in row one because we're approximating a PDE at X1. And these are the entries that go into the first, second, and third uh, columns. So the boundary condition U dx equals zero causes this strange addition to occur. Okay. Um, so whatever stencil coefficients you get um, for these two points, you have to add together because you're multiplied by the same unknown. And you're going to have a similar thing happen at the other boundary. So at um, so your last row of your matrix, you're approximating four thirds of x n, and that's going to use these points. Um, but here, this is u n plus one equals zero because of uh, that boundary condition, um, and then uh, u dx at uh, x n plus one, which is equal to one, is also zero. Therefore. We use the center difference for this, u n plus 2 minus u n over 2h is 0. Therefore, u n plus 2 is equal to u n. Um, so, um, so if you write out what the stencil is like this here, but at x n, uh, it'll be this point and this point. So A0 plus A2 will have to be added together in the, instead of a 1, 1 entry at that boundary, it'll be the N, N entry at this boundary. Um, so it all, works, it all works out the same way, it's just flipped. Um, and then for all the other rows of the matrix, you're not going to have anything um, unusual happen because, for example, at I equals 2, you would use these points, but this one is off the edge, but your but you're, you're got, your solution is zero there, so you can just ignore it. Um, and similar for uh, like an x, x n minus one, you're using these five points, and this one goes off the edge, but again, it's zero. So only at the um, uh, First and last rules, do you have to do anything strange? Um, but at least you could use a center difference. Yeah, so you're still, you're still using the same stencil for every row. And um, the resulting matrix will, will still be symmetric. Boundary conditions are only impacting uh, diagonal entries. Um, but yeah, what you should expect to get is uh, uh, second order accuracy. Okay. Other questions? Any problem? <coughs> hmm. Okay. Now, um, like this uh, during my first year at Stanford, um, the focus was largely on uh, finite difference methods like these. Um, although we were mainly on time-dependent problems, which we'll get to uh, later on. Um, but we uh, deviated for a little while to uh, talk about uh, the next methods here, spectral methods. Uh, so I'm hoping I can do them justice and give you an idea to why I think they're the coolest method, and why I've chosen to <coughs> focus on, on those for my career. Even though I'm not actually going to talk about my own spectral methods much. <coughs> okay. um, so, finite 
have two different stuff here. What we're seeing is this is what's called, you've seen in the homework. The error is always turns out to be some power of the uh, grid spacing. Um, and uh, what that power is depends on how many points you use in your stencil and, um, and also uh, any uh, symmetry that you might uh, benefit from. Um, but for spectral methods, um, the error is um, goes to zero exponentially. faster than any power of h. Okay. Um, so, uh, actually what we'll see is something along the lines of h to the 1 over h. Um, but as h is going to 0, that, you think of the, the, the power of h actually increasing uh, with the grid resolution. Um, so, um, now, as far as I can more comparisons uh, between the two, um, as far as advantages and disadvantages um, of that. Um, okay. So find a difference in spectral. Uh, so besides this order of accuracy. Okay. Um, different methods, those are methods that have like a local character. What I mean by local is to, about, to approximate the PDE at a certain point, you are only using neighboring points. That's what we're seeing in these stencils, like for a sports derivative. At xi, you're using points, like two points to the left and two points to the right, and that's it. And other values have no impact at that point. Spectral methods are mobile. Uh, to approximate the PDE at a certain point actually makes use of information from all points. But still does it in a, in a, in a surprisingly efficient way. Um, now, um, spectral methods, so um, those are more limited, uh, unfortunately, than um, other methods like finite difference or finite element or finite point. Um, they're invent mainly for linear. Um, problems with uh, smooth uh, solutions. In fact, this uh, behavior of the error going to zero so fast only happens if the solution is uh, infinitely smooth. Like, for instance, in uh, the uh, heat equation or uh, the Poisson equation. So we, we do have PDEs like that, but for problems involving like discontinuities, things like that, then spectral methods are not the method of choice. Um, Whereas finite difference methods tend to have a broader applicability. Um, now, when you're dealing with things like you know, nonlinear PDEs or complicated domains, those are a pain for any method. It's just that finite difference methods or uh, other methods that we'll see are more adaptable to those kinds of problems than. Uh, Um, but the reason why we're still interested in spectral methods um, is that um, when you do have this kind of favorable situation, spectral methods, oh, they are like the champions. They're so much better than the alternatives. So you may not be able to apply them Many problems with life, but the ones we can apply them for, um, they're very often. Um, and uh, and that's what I what I saw when I learned about them um, uh, in, in this, this this kind of class. Um, that a lot of the things that presented problems for finite difference methods, you just didn't have to worry about with uh, spectral methods. You got so much more accuracy, so much more efficiency, um, and 
But at the same time, I was indignant about this, that they're kind of limited. So you could say that the bulk of my research program has been focused on trying to extend these benefits to a wider array of problems, a wider variety of problems uh, than uh, they've been using thought so far. And actually, with thought process, uh, like for instance, for, for uh, nonlinear equations and such, or even equations involving some discontinuities, like uh, for instance, the uh, honor species of uh, uh, police and uh, Sarah Long. Um, so, um, now in, in covering these things, you're going to focus on these kind of nice problems and give ideas to how spectral methods can be used uh, for them and why they're so effective compared to uh, finite difference. So the idea behind spectral methods, uh, to multiply differences, we represent the solution as some uh, linear combination of basis functions. Um, and um, so then the challenge is how we compute these coefficients uh, in that basis. And the uh, basis functions are chosen to have some favorable properties that allow us to compute these coefficients um, uh, efficiently. And I'll give you a couple examples of the kind of basis functions that we'll be dealing with. Um, for example, if it, uh, let's suppose that your domain is the interval 0 to 5. And we have periodic boundary conditions. Um, then we use Fourier series. <coughs> we utilize the sum of some Fourier coefficients times e to the i k x. Um, and we take advantage of the fact that these functions e to the i k x are very easy to differentiate. So problems with cost and coefficients, uh, these are quite nice. Um, and we use the FFT, Fast Fourier Transform, that allows us to compute these coefficients UK hat um, very rapidly. Okay. Um, and I normally work with these kind of problems in my research. Um, another situation, though, let's suppose the domain is minus 1 to 1, and whatever boundary conditions we have, they're not periodic. Like maybe it's uh, Dirichlet or, or Neumann, homogeneous or not. Um, now, one uh, popular choice, not the only choice, but you know, taking advantage of nice properties, we use Chebyshev polynomials. So u of x is a linear combination. Coefficients times the uh, Chebyshev polynomials, and I brought this up in other classes, but fresh memory. They're defined to be cosine of k inverse cosine. And minus one to one, um, and that doesn't look like a polynomial, but um, what you get is if k equals zero, cosine of 
uh, 0 is 1. So t0 is 1. If k equals 1, you get this cosine of inverse cosine of x, which is just x. And then using the identities for a sine, uh, sorry, cosine of a uh, sum and difference, you can get a three term occurrence relation. Each polynomial depends on the previous two. So, for instance, the third uh, term of polynomial, so second degree, would be t2 of x is 2x squared minus 1, um, and so on. Now, um, at the start, I'm going to focus on this first case, periodic gravity conditions where we're using a uh, Fourier series. So we'll see how we can approximate derivatives with very different approaches to using these stencils that we have been using. But it's still uh, uh, related to that in a way. Now, um, okay. Actually, I need to make sure that my notes are consistent. Here. Just note about that. Um, Fourier series is always written in so many different ways. So, be consistent. I'm going to stick a factor, scaling factor of one over two pi here. Here, where UK hat is defined as the integral zero two pi. Minus i to the x. Okay. Um, now, the way this formula is obtained is um, using the fact that if, if I take the inner product of both sides of this equation with um, e to the i k x, so so from here. I'm multiplied by not e to the i k x, but it's complex conjugate, and integrate from zero to two pi, and add sum that I can pull out of the integral. E k hat also pulled out of the integral, and you get. Use a different letter here. I could use uh, j. So then I have e to the minus ijx e to the ikx. Okay. So here I have this inner product. Um, now, um, what happens here is this integral. 
uh, the uh, functions e to the ikx, where k is an integer, uh, are orthogonal. So this integral is equal to 0 if j is not equal, not equal to k. And then if, um, if j equals k, these will cancel out. And I'm just integrating 1 from 0 to 2 pi, which gives me 2 pi, which cancels with the other 2 pi. Uh, thus leaving only u j hat. Uh, so that's that's how where this formula for u uh, u k hat comes from. It's uh, we're taking in a product of both sides of these uh, basis functions and exploiting the orthogonality of these functions e to the i k x. Okay. Um, now. Um, We want to approximate this for a series on an endpoint grid, like we've been using before, finding different lengths. Um, so what I do in that case is I let uj be the, the similar form, except k will go from minus n over 2 plus 1 n over 2. And I'm going to assume for convenience that n is uh, even. So this sum will have n terms altogether. Uh, uk hat e to the i k x j. So I'm plugging in a specific x um, in this case. So uj is my approximation of u of x j, which is why I plug in x j over here. Um, and now I need a formula for uk hat that approximates uh, this integral. So uk hat is defined to be, um, so I'm going to have h, my uh, grid spacing, um, h is defined to be 2 pi over n. Um, Sum is minus i k x j u k. So you can think of h as playing the role of the dx here, um, and I'm just evaluating this integrand at each of my grid points, summing them up and multiplying by the, the dx. So this is a very crude quadrature rule. Um, so it's really it's almost like a rectangle rule, but it's the most primitive quadrature rule there is. Um, but um, so it's, it's, it's easy to take advantage of this uh, uniform grid. And it's also conducive to algorithms like the fast Fourier transform we can use to, because it, the thing is, we have to compute n of these. We're doing this for each k. Uh, k equals, minus n over 2 plus 1 up to n over 2. So we're going to think, okay. Okay. We have n of these to compute. Each one has a summation with n terms. You might think, oh, let's order n squared work. Well, if you do it that simple by, a simple kind of way, yes, it is. But the fast Fourier transform uses um, basically the, the certain symmetries to compute all of these quantities in order n log to base 2 of n operations, which when n is large, that uh, makes a huge difference. Uh, so that's one of the uh, most ingenious algorithms we have in the 20th century, the fast Fourier transform. Um, okay. Um, now, there's one... Um, drawback that can happen of, uh, because what we're doing is our function u of x, our exact function, is representing using waves of infinitely many frequencies, all frequencies from minus infinity to infinity. But now we're limiting that to waves of this range of frequencies. Um, now of course, the larger n is, we can come in a wide span of frequencies, but the point is we're still limiting ourselves. And there's one 
troublesome, uh, actually there are two troublesome phenomena, there's only one I discussed in the notes, but I'll mention both of them, uh, that happen as a result of cutting off the Fourier series um, after a certain, outside of a certain range of k's. But here's something you can go very long about. Uh, the first problem is called aliasing. Um, so let's suppose I have a function of my interval 0 to 2 pi that has very high frequency content, um, a lot of oscillations. I'm sure of that due to sloppiness in my graph, but this curve I've drawn actually violates the vertical line test. It's not literally a function, <laughs> but uh, let's just sweep it up for luck. Um, but now suppose I have a relatively small number of grid points n. Therefore, I'm only sampling this function every so often. Um, so I'll just go with that spacing. So now what I'm going to do is, so my, so it's my Fourier series reconstruction, where I compute Fourier coefficients using the formulas on the endpoint grid over there, so the formulas toward the bottom of the board. And then I plot that function. So what function do I actually have now? If I, it's basically going to play connect the dots here, try to, well, actually, Um, where I've sampled. So for instance, my grid, this would be x0, x1, x2, x3, and so on, all the way down to x n minus 1. Um, okay, so it's going to look something like this. So, all I did is just connect the dots with the samples that I have. Um, looks nothing like a uh, function that we were sampling from. Um, but what ends up happening is um, the true Fourier coefficient, u hat k, where k is large because of the high frequency oscillation actually ends up getting added on to some lower frequency wave. That's why it's called aliasing, that amplitudes of high frequency waves are assigned or added to amplitudes of lower frequency waves, which creates a very different function. So it's not really accurate to say that this content, that this high frequency content is ignored, uh, but instead, it is given the wrong frequency. Um, so, in fact, um, okay. If I use this notation, uk hat, to refer to the integral, the true Fourier coefficients, and I'll use u tilde k refer to the approximation that I have over there. Um, yeah. Um, 
sum over the good points. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, there's actually a theorem in a book co-written by my first advisor that uh, says that um, these approximate Fourier series coefficients are a sum of true um, Fourier series coefficients with the same frequency plus integer multiples of n. Um, so what happens is um, so th th this means that these, these amplitudes that come from waves of all kinds of different frequencies are spaced and apart get lumped together. Um, now if these Amplitudes are insignificant, then it's not really a problem. But what if they are? Then um, you have sub a substantial error. Um, although on the flip side, suppose that this function has no Fourier series coefficients outside of that frequency range from minus n over two plus one n over two. That says that the Fourier series is exact uh, at all points, not just the points where we interpolate. Um, so, so it's it's a double-edged sword. Um, okay, so that's one bad thing about Fourier series. It's a uh, alias thing. How would you deal with that? Really, the only remedy you have is just to increase n, just use more grid points, so that um, any waves that are left out have an amplitude that is so small that it, uh, you can neglect it. All right. Um, now, um, so okay, so that's, so that's uh, one problem. Uh, another problem with Fourier series is called the Gibbs phenomenon. Now, um, in general, if your function u of x is in um, has k continuous derivatives, um, then the Fourier series coefficients. Actually, I'm going to use a different letter here. C p. So we have p continuous derivatives. Then u k hat. Um, can be bounded by some constant over um, yeah. um, then it's, it's possible to uh, bound the Fourier coefficients like this for some constant c. Um, so the Fourier coefficients generally go to zero as k goes to plus or minus infinity. But this indicates at what rate they go to zero. So the smoother the function is, the more rapidly the Fourier coefficients go to zero. So for particularly smooth functions, like a Gaussian function, you could use uh, relatively few Fourier series coefficients, uh, which is uh, quite advantageous. Um, but what if um, U is not even a continuous function. Um, so that's when things can go uh, pretty badly. Um, and the thing is, this even applies to functions that are we normally think of as continuous functions. Because it's not just a matter of being continuous, they have to be continuous when viewed as a 2 pi periodic function. So let's try f of x equal x. Um, so, if we look at it from 0 to 2 pi, okay, fine, but then we actually 
actually take as two pi periodic extension. Uh, so then it behaves like this. So this graph repeats. So now it's a discontinuous function, discontinuous every two pi. Um, so for this reason, uh, we actually call this function the sawtooth function. And you see the graph kind of looks like the teeth of a saw. Um, so what happens when you take a Fourier series of this um, and you cut it off after a certain point? Then uh, if, you, if you were to graph that, you would get something like this, where um, as you get closer to these discontinuities, you have growing oscillations that dissipate as you get to move away from discontinuities, then they come back. Um, and this, this is what Gibbs phenomenon is. Uh, so that's very bad uh, to have this uh, kind of situation. Um, because a Fourier series, as uh, k goes to infinity, as the number of terms becomes infinite, the Fourier series does converge to a function value at every single point. But because it's uh, discontinuous, it, it takes so many terms to get that convergence it's not practical. You have to cut the series off at some point. You can't just have infinitely many terms. Um, so that's why you have this uh, behavior. And these oscillations, they don't go away just because you include more terms. It's always a problem. Um, so um, so we, we, that's why it's important for spectral methods to work with functions that, uh, that are smooth, um, that even when, when you would treat it as two by periodic extension, if we don't have that, then Fourier series is not a good idea. You're better off using, uh, for instance, uh, you still use spectral methods, but you'd be using like you know, Trebuchet polynomials. I got a question. Yeah. On the sampling points here and how you expect it that you get this yes. not original function reconstructed, is that just in general from Fourier methods or from that? Uh, um, oh, yeah, just, just Fourier series in general. So this, this is really not about the FFT, because okay. the FFT gives you both these discrete coefficients exactly and faster, but you still have the <clears throat> Okay. Um, well, this is a good uh, break point. values of uh, function u on the grid, uh, n. Um, so each these values is the approximation of function u at a grid point. Equally spaced. So, my going values one to n. So, I'm ignoring this one. That was here, but not really because I am using this point x n. And we're assuming periodicity. So this value, value at this point, equals the value at this point. Um, OK, so given these, uh, and we can actually call this a grid function. So that's just a spectrum of values. Uh, we want to find what is called a differentiation matrix. that I'll call um, dn, so that, so if I carry out this matrix vector product, um, then each of these values is an, appro is an approximation of u prime 
at that uh, grid point. So I just want to perform a matrix vector multiplication to uh, compute the uh, derivative. Now we already have a differentiation matrix from finite differences that you can use like a forward difference or backward difference or center difference, but we want more accuracy. Which I will call spectral accuracy, meaning that the error is uh, order h to the p for all for all integers p. Um, so, um, so in other words, the error goes to zero faster than any polynomial at any power of uh, of h. Okay. Um, This is um, like with finite differences, we re we've replaced u by its Taylor polynomial, took it out to a certain number of terms, and used that to get our stencil. So, what we do in this case is we take that to the extreme. Um, instead of picking some low degree polynomial like the finite differences, we're going to use as high a degree of polynomial as we, uh, um, as we can, but not an ordinary polynomial. Um, we're going to use this function that is the truncated Fourier series um, and this is called the BLI which stands for band limited um, and we also call this a, it's not a polynomial, it is a trigonometric polynomial. Um, because instead of having like x to the k, we have e to the ix raised to the k. Um, now to, to uh, take apart the name. It's a bit called band limited because there's a we only use a finite range of frequencies. So that so in other words, the band width, bandwidth of its function is limited to um, n over two. So it's these k values here. Um, and it's called an interpolus because the value at each grid point is equal to the value of u um, at that point. Uh, just, so just like a polynomial triplet matches a certain function at certain points, uh, this does too. Okay. Now, um, in the early discussion, like way back we talked about just plain old PDEs before getting into finite differences, I mentioned a Dirac delta function that's zero almost everywhere. So now we have a, and I'm going to use a discrete analog of that. Um, the discrete delta function delta j um, It's kind of similar to the Kronecker delta, but it only uses one index instead of two. So it's equal to one if j is equal to zero mod n. So we're, using, we're still imposing 2 pi periodicity on this. Um, and then it's equal to 0 otherwise. Uh, so it's kind of like the Dirac delta function um, in that sense. And the reason I'm doing that is um, it lets me express each um, grid value in terms of all of the grid values. So I have u m delta j minus m because this is equal to one only if um, 
m is equal to j um, uh, mod n. So it has a way of selecting the uh, value that you want. Um, okay. So what that lets me do is express my band limit interpolant in a similar way as a linear combination of these times the band limited interpolant of this. So I'll call this pj of x minus xm. So this is the band limited interpolant of delta j minus m um, evaluated at uh, whatever x. Because if I plug in x equal to xj, this is going to be 0 unless j is equal to m um, uh, mod n. So what I'm doing is this function is only defined at the grid points. I need a function that's defined over a continuum for all x. Uh, and, and this is it right here. Um, so because p of xj is equal to uj, um, like I have over here. Okay. And the reason why I need this is because I can't differentiate this. This is just a collection of discrete points. For to take derivatives, I need an actual function, a continuous function. And this is it right here. So I'm going to differentiate this. Um, so my approximation of u prime x j, and that is given by sum of u m, and then I have p j prime x j minus x m. Okay. Now, the reason why this helps me solve my original problem is if this is actually the JM entry of my, the matrix that I'm looking for. Because what I'm doing here is I'm viewing this as a matrix vector product. Um, might be more intuitive if I actually wrote the UM over here. Okay. Because if we look at a generic matrix vector product, AX, entry I, we have A, I, J, X, J. Notice the I index is fixed. It's this value here. The J index varies. It's the column index of the matrix entry. It's the entry of the vector you're multiplying by. This is the exact same thing. If you look at the index patterns, different letters, but it's the same index pattern. So here, here also we have a component of a matrix vector product. So if I can figure these out, this part here that I'm boxing, I'm done. I'll have my matrix, except that figuring it out, as you'll see, is going to be kind of a pain. Um, OK. Um, now, um, so in order to figure this out, I can use the fact that, uh, um, because this, as I mentioned in the previous board, is a band limited interpolant of uh, oh, yeah, j minus m. Um, so, but I can express this as a Fourier series. So, Oh, sorry, not pj prime. pj is that. Okay. Um, so I can write pj of x 
as a truncated Fourier series. So if I just focus on, for instance, uh, uh, yeah, the one, uh, one work with the unshifted delta function, and then I'll shift it again later. Um, That's what it says in the notes. All right. uh, it's just that we're taking that band limit of turbulence. And here, by what we plug into it, um, that has the effect of uh, uh, shifting. OK. So. So since PJ is a triple and delta J, I can write it this way using a truncated Fourier series. I did the same thing earlier with uh, U of X, uh, the general function, where these coefficients are defined as before. Um, put my uh, spacing H, and then I have the sum. So I'm just using a formula for the coefficients from before, but now my function is delta j. Um, okay. So, but delta j is equal to 1 when j is 0, and it's gonna, all the other values are going to be 0. So, this is going to be h and, oh, um, well, I'm sorry, j has to equal 0 mod n. So the only term here that's going to be non-zero is when j is equal to n. So e to the minus i k x n times delta n, which is 1. Now, xn is equal to n times h, but it's basic. But h is 2 pi over n. So now it's going to be h e to the minus i 2 pi k. k is an integer. Can anyone tell me what that is equal to? e to the minus 2 pi i k. How can we rewrite e to the i anything? Are you talking about sine cosine? Yes. Yeah. Um, oh, what are we going to? Um, so that would be h times cosine of 2 pi of k. Well, I don't need a minus because cosine is an even function. Minus i sine of 2 pi k. But that's, so this is 1. So we just get h. So all of the Fourier coefficients of a truncated Fourier series of my band limit triple of pj, they're all equal to h. So yeah, e to any e to the i times any multiple of 2 pi is equal to 1. OK. I'm not sure if I can finish this in time, but I'll do what I can. Um, OK. So therefore, I can write pj of x. I'll just take that and substitute it back in here. We're all equal to h, so I'll just pull out the h. h over 2 pi times this sum, and then just have e to the i kx. All right. <clears throat> um, 
So now I have to try to figure out um, what that is. And in fact, expressing it to the sines and cosines is going to help with that. So it's going to get really ugly. We need uh, trig identities. You just taught trig. I should have you do that. <laughs> <laughs> might help then. Um, or you'll see new outlet of our importance. Um, okay. So using the fact that uh, uh, e to the i kx is cosine kx plus i sine kx. So I have now pj of x. Well, actually, I'll just focus on that sum. I'll, I mean, I'll multiply by h over 2 pi at the end. E to the i k x is now equal to sum uh, cosine k x plus i times sum over the same indice sine k x. And now we need to see what we can do with this. And um, so here's some trig identities that will be useful um, of, of two different types. First, we have a product to sum identity. That cosine A sine B is equal to 1 half sine A plus B minus sine A minus B. Um, these are consequences of the sum and difference formulas for cosine and uh, actually this one sine. Uh, so if you know the, those two identities, like for cosine sine difference, you can derive all the other ones from them. them. Anyway, um, and then you also have a sum to product identity. Uh, sine a plus sine b is so it's kind of like an inverse of this. 2 sine a plus b over 2 cosine a minus b over 2. Okay. Um, oh, wow. I didn't write it all out. Oh, I'm such a bastard. Okay. Wow, I really shot myself in the foot here. Okay, well, I want you guys to see it. Hopefully I can do without gloriously messing up. And I have 18 points. Okay, so what I do is, uh, okay. Uh, well, one way in which I'm going to be kind of lazy here is I'm actually not going to deal with this part. And the reason why is pj of x is real. So it's not supposed to have an imaginary part. So this should end up going away anyway. So I can focus on this to determine uh, a better expression for pj of x that I can uh, differentiate. So if I were to write out all those cosines, so, so now we have uh, cosine kx. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, multiply and divide by sine kx over 2, sine kx over 2. Um, that's what will set me up to be able to use these identities. So the one in the denominator, I'm just going to pull out. Um, and then, for the rest, um, even though the sum goes from minus n over 2 plus 1 to n over 2, I'm going to... Um, Start it out at uh, k equals 0, cover the positive k values, and then deal with the negatives. So I'm going to have uh, 1 for k equals 0, then co cosine x, and I'll, I'll work in the sine kx over 2 at the end, uh, plus cosine 2x, and so on, all the way up to 
cosine n over 2 minus 1x plus cosine n over 2x. So this covers all the positive values of k, or non-negative values of k. And then I need to loop back around and do the negative values. And I'm going to start with k equal minus 1. So cosine minus x plus cosine minus 2x and so forth, all the way down to cosine minus n over 2 minus 1x. And that's it. This is everything. Now, using your immense knowledge of trig functions, can you tell me how I can easily combine a lot of most of these terms? It's, oh, wait, cosine x and cosine negative x. Right. Yeah. Are, um, wait, hold on, okay. Cosine. <laughs> cosine. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Cosine is an even function. So I can drop all these minuses. So now I have now I have uh, well, there are two terms that don't really fit in this pattern. They were k equals zero and k equals n over two. I'm gonna write those separate. Well, actually, I better not do that. Uh, one plus 2 cosine x, 2 cosine 2x, so on, all the way down to 2 cosine n over 2 minus 1x, and then odd man out this one here, cosine n over 2x, all times sine kx over 2. Um, all right. Now, the next thing I'll do is I'm finally going to make use of this sine kx over 2 that's in the numerator um, for a little bit of trickery. Okay, so when I distribute, the product to sum formula that I wrote there. Um, so, well, first the twos oh, and the... Uh, what? what? Go ahead. I said uh, I okay. looked up the table. Uh, okay. So these twos will um, cancel out with the one half. So this will become, for instance, a uh, sign of, okay, um, Sorry, this k should not be here. It's a sine x over 2. So it's sine of these two arguments added together minus them, uh, and that also is x over 2. Um, okay. Minus sine of them subtracted. I'm actually going to write the subtracted one first so you can even worse and see what happens. So this term, minus sine of this minus this, x minus x over 2, that's just x over 2, plus sine of these two arguments added together. 3x over 2. Then I move to the next one. This 2 cancels out with a 1 half. And then I have sine, so the minus sine of this minus this, 3x over 2, plus sine of these two arguments added together, sine 5x over 2. If you look at what I've written so far, and you see what's going to happen, Last term is. 
Um, the addition yeah. of the second to last time and the yes. last time. Yeah, everything's canceled. Gone, 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 gone. Everything gone. Well, that's going to go away too. Um, so if we go here, so we have minus sine um, this minus this. So uh, n minus 3 over 2 x, but that's going to cancel with something else from before. Um, plus sine of these arguments added. So, um, okay, so n minus 2 over 2, so n minus 1 over 2x. Um, and then here we apply the same identity, except this time there's no 2 here. So there's going to be a minus 1 half sine n minus 1 over 2 x um, plus 1 half sine these two add together and plus 1 over 2 x all times uh, the 1 over sine x over 2 out there so so these terms they don't cancel they, they will you can combine like terms so then what's left All that. Okay. And yeah, we have quite a mess to clean up here. <laughs> um, all right. So what we get is we have the one over sine x over two, and then we have one half. Sine n minus one over two x plus one half sine and plus one over two x. Okay, um, and at this point is where I use the other identity, the sum to product identity, where that sum of signs can be written as a sine times a cosine with a factor of two, which gets rid of the one halves. So I'm going to get uh, sine of, um, okay, so it was missed because the dang it's already cut out again. Uh, applying the sum to product formula, it's sine of these two arguments added together divided by 2, which gives n over 2 times x, and then times cosine of these arguments subtracted from one another, which gives Cosine of minus x over 2, but cosine is an even function, therefore it's cosine x over 2. Now, pj of x, I had h over 2 pi times all this, because all of this was only the sum of the cosine kx's. So now I have this times this. And now, cosine over sine is cotangent. Um, oh, uh, or, if I leave it as the denominator, that would be tangent. x over 2 down below. And then sine n over 2x uh, up above. So now I have a new formula for my uh, band limited turbulent of my delta function. And this is in closed form, meaning there's no summation. Definitely a lot easier to work with. So now what I can do is um, I need a derivative of this. Well, now I can take it. Now, take the derivative, that would require a quotient rule. Um, now, I'm not going to, well, the, the derivative is, uh, the quotient rule application is written out in the um, uh, notes. But I don't need a derivative at any point, any old point. I only need it at grid points. And that helps because it causes a term to drop out. So pj prime of kh, because x k is kh, and what I get is um, one half minus one to the k cotangent of uh, kh over two. Um, so if you work out the derivative of this using the quotient rule, plug in x is equal to kh, and you use certain things like 
sine of an integer multiple pi is zero. Uh, cosine of k pi is equal to minus one over k. That's where that minus one over k comes from. Uh, things like that. Then, um, then we get that. Um, so now, u prime at xj, um, which was previously described as sum over m, um, pj prime of xj minus xm, but xj minus xm is the same as j minus m times h. Um, so, so now what I can do is I can plug that into here. So u prime of xj is equal to a sum of 1 half minus 1 to the j minus m. So whenever you see k, it becomes j minus m. Uh, cotangent j minus m over 2h. All that times um. So these right here are my, um, are my matrix entries. Um, now, um, I should point out before I write down the matrix, as n goes to infinity, um, what we end up getting is, um, uh, well, cotangent is 1 over tangent. A tangent of x, as x goes to 0, behaves kind of like x. Um, then what we get is the sum over minus infinity to infinity m not equal to 0 of minus 1 to j minus m, 1 over j minus m h times u m. So that's what the matrix entries go to in the limit as uh, the number of grid points uh, goes to infinity. But now what I can do is write down the matrix. So the matrix entries really depend only on which diagonal you're on. So, uh, so first of all, um, when supposed to happen is down the main diagonal you get zeros. Um, wait, I'll just okay. Yeah, I, I have to exclude m equal to j. We don't because this this like, that expression is undefined on the diagonal. Uh, but yeah, the diagonal entries are actually um, supposed to be zero, uh, just like in a center difference. Uh, find a difference uh, matrix. Yes, you can find out which one you're on. Can you go back to where you started? I'm just confused. So it's not like cotangent is like what? Oh, cotangent is one over tangent. As x goes to zero, tangent x is similar to x, um, and that's where this approximation. Comes. Um, so then your uh, off diagonal entries, like for instance, when j minus m is equal to 1, um, so we're going to have um, 1 half cotangent h over 2. Well, this is the So this is j minus n equal to minus 1. So there's 1 over h, well, sorry, 1 half cotangent h over 2, all the way down this diagonal. And then we have minus 1 half cotangent h over 2. So the matrix is skew symmetric. 
as a second, as a first derivative matrix typically is. Uh, and then on the next diagonals, the diagonals alternate sign. So here we have like minus one half cotangent two h over two, whereas down below here we have um, plus one half cotangent two h over two, and so on. Um, so we just have increasing arguments like that. So h over two, two h over two, three h over two, and so on. And the, the whole matrix gets filled, and it's skew symmetric. Um, now, uh, so that gives us. Oh dang, I'm a little bit past time. Um, so that gives us a derivative with spectral accuracy. Um, and if we want higher derivatives. For u x x, just square it, um, and there are formulas for that that are in the notes in terms of uh, uh, cosecant squared, um, and, that's, and that's actually a uh, symmetric matrix. So that would give a higher derivative with uh, uh, special accuracy. Now, the thing is, with a finite difference matrix, you have a sparse matrix like tridiagonal, something like that. So matrix ve vector multiplication is very quick. This matrix vector multiplication is not quick. So I'm thinking, well, why bother? Um, but you can actually carry out matrix vector multiplication with this kind of matrix more efficiently using a fast Fourier transform. Because the number way to get a derivative for a periodic function is take the fast Fourier transform, then you just multiply all of the uh, components by i k, and then take the and then do the inverse fast Fourier transform to go back. Um, and that's something I can talk uh, more about uh, tomorrow. Okay, so this is our first spectral. Differentiation matrix. So the order of accuracy, that's where I'll stop in a few seconds. Instead of order like h squared or whatever, it's order of h to the 1 over h because that's h to the n, where n is the number of grid points. And we're using all the grid points. Um, so that goes to 0 faster than any polynomial power of h because as h goes to 0, we have h, it's like having h to a higher and higher power that's accelerating. Um, so, um, so, so um, much more accuracy than we see from uh, finite difference. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I also have a professor who I put the video on fast. Yeah. Because he talked too slow. Yeah. <laughs> 